the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 747, the Jumbo Edition, for Monday, February 4th, 2019. <laughs> The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, you know, the show where we answer your questions. We share the tips you send in. We share cool stuff found. In general, we get together so that every single one of us can learn at least five new things every week. Sponsors for this episode include LinkedIn Jobs at linkedin.com slash MGG, PDF Pen from smilesoftware.com slash podcast, and Eero. From Eero.com slash MGG. We'll talk all about each of those briefly in a bit here, here in downright balmy Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in likewise balmy Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How are you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? I went from zero to like yeah. spring almost. It's amazing. <laughs> zero it's to crazy. 60 in about a week. For us, Seriously. Here. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that like it was. I I think it. You could argue it was sixty degrees here at at, at one point earlier this afternoon. So yeah. yeah, but the weather was nice enough in uh, Atlanta. I think they had the uh, the game down there, right? Or, um, yeah, the big game, the big game, aka the we, Super we Bowl. We, we can, we can say, say the Super that, Bowl. Right? Yep, yep. We would love to get sued by the NFL and win because we would win. <laughs> Because that the NFL doesn't seem to understand how trademark law works, but that's okay. We're good here. Oh, well, it was good. It, 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 all I got to say, because we're not the football geek gap. No, but, no, I no, mean, we, we are not. In the sports, I always enjoy it as an event. And I would say this was probably the least exciting event that I, between the game and none of the people I knew that did the halftime show and all that. So it was still okay. Yeah, it was less than spectacular. Uh, I'll give you that. Yeah, it was. I, I thought it was a fun game to watch, but uh, but less than spectacular for sure. Yeah, I'm trying to get my my candle lit here, John, and it's just not like I can't. <laughs> what? Whoa! I like to have a uh, a candle lit oh, while we're podcasting, right. and it's like the right. hardest right. thing I've ever done in my life to get this thing lit. So I just made it a mission, and now it's lit. So really, Jack Frost from Yankee Candle, a nice uh, a nice minty. Fresh smell, which is good, stimulates the uh, stimulates the brain a little bit. We should get yourself because I got one of these. Um, th- they have one of these uh, things that you can use to, I guess, to light candles or like uh, to light your grill because a lot of grills the the starter fails, so yeah. it has like a really long tube and it makes it really easy. To light sure, things. yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, I usually have a, a long like a, an electric match, you know, kind of thing here in uh, and but no, I, I I'm just using like a tiny little lighter here that i had to shove oh, i remember when i was an act when i was a wee lad and i was an acolyte we had this like special bar that we used to like light the candles on the uh this is really getting off track here yeah. but i was one I, I got to light the candles one time it was really it was oh, that's really good. awesome that's good you ever used a candle snuffer that's a, a, just oh, yeah. another well, that was on the other end of the candle there, lighter was the candle snuffer hey i have a tip to share to change gears entirely uh my mother was having some issues with her phone and some strange things were happening. And there were some strange accounts listed in her, uh, if she went from to, you know, settings, uh, what is it now? Passwords and accounts. There were some accounts here in addition to the ones that she had added, but unlike the ones she had added, she could not delete these that were here. And that made me think, aha, There's only one way that we can lock something in here, and that is via profiles. So I had her go to settings, general profiles, and sure enough, uh, there were several things in here. I don't want to say that she didn't install, but that she wasn't aware of having installed. I I, I think she these profiles can be added here uh, by going to a website in Safari And it offering to install one for you, perhaps if you say, hey, I want the weather or something. It's like, cool, if you want the our weather widget, you need to install this profile. And in fact, it's, you know, like spyware or malware or something like that. So uh, so the tip is, well, twofold. Number one, that that's where that stuff is. And number two, 
it's good for all of us to go and visit settings, general profiles every now and again, because you, you might have something there that perhaps you did intentionally put there, but you've since forgotten about. So there you go. You know, Dave, this is very timely because I ran into something similar. Okay. And that um, I was um, one of a, was it malware? I think it was malware bytes, but, but one of the pieces of software, in my computer said, Hey, you got a virus. And okay. I looked and I'm like, and it was like this installer for like this program I got. Like it, it was a really old zip file from a, a prior. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, but all of a sudden it's like, Hey, you got this thing called a uh, cross rider. And um, I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, why does this all of a sudden come out? Uh, the, because this isn't new. Right. So I think it was just false positive, but then I researched this virus and we're going to link to an article that talks about it. And this virus on the Mac does exactly what you saw on ios is oh. that it tricks you into installing configuration profiles and if you don't know about that is um that's usually not a good thing having uh, someone else install them unless you know they're installing them because they can take control or you know read your they can do almost anything yeah now to be fair these things can't just magically get installed you have no, to you agree have to Yes. yes. Yeah. But they can they can trick you into agreeing to that if you're not entirely aware of what they're asking about. So, yeah. And on your Mac, where are those profiles listed on your Mac? I think it's just system preferences profiles. You normally will not see it only if you use something okay. like Camp or whatever, but it's in the it's the in system, system preferences. preferences. Okay. The one, two, three, fourth row got it. and then you'll see next to accessibility if you have any profiles you'll see a little thing that you know it's like a little star with a check mark and it says profiles but if you don't have any profiles on your mac you won't see that icon in system preferences got it's, it um, okay that's good to know yeah but yeah. i have it because i have set up you know my machines for uh remote administration yeah and i think the same is true on ios that you won't see settings general profile until you have profiles installed uh, I think the same thing's true. So, yeah, well, I think they show. Well, they show uh, on iOS. I think they show up in the same place that your certificates do, right? But it's all pro, isn't it? Yes, right. right. Um, no, I don't. Well, no, no. maybe. Well, j- oh, here we go. Okay, so I'm looking on my iPhone right now. Okay. Um, general settings and towards the bottom profiles and device management. Okay, so interesting. So the name of that changes depending on what you have there, because I currently only have one thing installed, and it's my Xfinity Wi-Fi profile. So the label for that section is profile, not even profiles. But unlike my mom's phone, it was profiles. On yours, it's profiles and device management. So it depends on it. it, It's it's contextual. And I don't have any certs. Currently, I don't have my certs installed on my iOS device. So that's why it doesn't say just profile. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Cool. So that's kind of interesting that they tune that for whatever you got in there. Yeah. But yeah. If you got stuff in there and you don't know where it came from, then. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. actually, my experience is that at least on iOS, you should be able to get rid of it. Oh, yeah. If I was you- able to get rid of it. On, she was or she was on her phone. She just went in and, and told it to delete the profile. And that was the end of that. I remember when I was playing this for a while, though, it's tricky to get a profile in a state where the user can't delete it now you would think that's a good thing or a bad thing well you can yeah if you're doing device management yes you can you can make it so that the profile is undeletable without without you know reformatting the phone or whatever so yeah hey i want to talk about our first sponsor today john we'll mix things up a little bit our first sponsor today is pdf pen from smile And you would go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast to learn more about it. But PDF pen, this is one of those tools, you know, smile, they have a knack for this. They create tools that you can't live without. And just earlier today, I was using PDF pen. I had sent someone an invoice and they wrote me back and they said, we need your company ID on the invoice. And it was, it was somebody overseas. And I thought, well, company ID, like what ID do they want? I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter. I just need to put some ID on here. So I did. I pulled up our 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 state tax ID and uh, which is a public thing that you could get if you searched on the Web. So I figured, well, that's pretty innocuous. And uh, but I already had this invoice created 
And of course, it was created using our normal templates and all that. And I couldn't go back to the templates because I didn't want to add this to it. And I thought, aha, perfect. I'll use PDF pen. And sure enough, I used I pulled up the PDF. I placed this in. I matched the font close enough and put that right in there. And now I have a beautiful PDF that is their invoice. I didn't have to go and like reinvent the wheel. I just used PDF pen. Boom. To do that. There are other things PDF pen can do, though, even though it makes that super easy. You can go paperless with scanning and OCR. You can search for and even redact sensitive info, such as account numbers. In this case, I was doing the opposite of redaction. But maybe sometimes you want to do that if you want to share a PDF, but don't want people to see your credit card number or bank account number or things like that. You can even edit text in PDFs with PDF pen. There is so much that you can do. It is your Swiss army knife for PDFs and lets you do just about anything that you can conceive of. Very, very cool stuff. So, and now PDF pen and PDF pen pro version 10.2 include support for you guessed it, dark mode on Mojave, as well as smoother scrolling, faster thumbnail drawing and increased maximum zoom. So go check it out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast where you can learn all about this and more. And of course, our thanks to Smile and PDF Pen for sponsoring this episode. All right, let's go to, uh, let's go to Bob, shall we here, John? Let's see, what we need. Let's see what we get to. Bob writes, we'll dig right in. He says, uh, my 2011 iMac with 16 megs of RAM, 512 gig SSD with over 100 gigs free has slowed dramatically. I get a two to three second initial delay with any typing and very frequently get the spinning beach ball for three to 10 seconds. It otherwise functions well. It's just really slow. I don't think it's the hard drive because I put in an SSD just two to three years ago. Checking the drive with disk utility and drive DX shows it to be good. Cleaned all my caches, reset SMC and PRAM, removed old programs and files, reloaded the operating system all without any improvement. Checking activity monitor never shows the CPU to be above 50 to 60% and is usually much lower. Uh, it has delays with just the simplest of tasks, such as opening and typing in Safari. It boots up very slowly and I cannot boot into safe mode or it just takes a very long time and I am impatient. If I boot into a test account, it seems to be okay, leaving me lean, leaning me to believe that it is a software problem. But where? I was thinking of getting a new Mac anyway, so I ordered a new Mac mini. Core i5, six core i5 with the one terabyte SSD. My then question relates to setting up the new iMac. I plan to download all the apps from scratch when I can get the new machine. So I do not transfer whatever this problem is to the new machine, assuming it is software. My questions. Number one, I assume I can just transfer the data files, documents, music, photos, as they should not be a problem. I will download all the apps instead of migrating them over. What about the library folder? It contains stuff I do not understand and might contain the problem. Do I copy that over? I said, okay, not to. Should I copy any other folders? Okay. So um, this is a weird thing, right? Um, and I would, I would let it, the first thing I would do is, is commit some time and patience and see if you can get this thing to boot in safe mode. Um and then once that's up and, and here's the thing, here's the reason safe mode takes so long is it does a full file system scan um, and wipes out some uh, some of the caches so that it's forced to really, truly load the OS and not accidentally load something unintentional. Um, if you can get it to boot in safe mode, the first thing you should know about safe mode is that on most Macs graphics will seem a little sluggish because it doesn't usually load the accelerated graphics drivers. So like when you drag a window, you'll see it sort of lag behind a little bit in safe mode. That's generally normal. So don't worry about that. Other than that though, things should operate pretty lickety split and logging into your main account in safe mode would be the way to test to see, does this problem happen on your main account? Even when you're in safe mode, if it doesn't, then you know definitively that it is in fact software and you can start by hunting down software that might be a problem. Uh, you could look in system preferences, users and groups, look into your user and then log in items, see if something there sort of triggers any, any thoughts Lingon, which we'll put a link to in the show notes from Peter Borg's apps or Peter Borg apps.com uh, is another way to dig into that stuff. But, um, 
you, you know, I, I would, uh, I would look for third party backup software, right? Anything that's going to going to really do a lot of reading from the disc is what could cause the symptoms you're seeing. Um, things like malware scanners. If you've got something, you know, actively scanning for malware or viruses or whatever, that can cause that type of thing. Something doing a, you know, persistent index. Again, anything that's running full time and reading from the drive uh, in the background is what you're going to look for. So uh, let, let's, let, let's chew on that for a little bit, John, do you have any thoughts on that before we move on to his migration questions? Um, I'm with you on this. So one thing, the first thing I looked at, I just want to see the capabilities of this machine and this machine using Mac tracker. Um, so 16 megs of Ram that's, that's, uh, or gigs. Yes. Actually, all the numbers he did were in megabytes, and I think he meant gigs. He instead. meant gigs. Yep. Yep. Like, yeah, absolutely. I don't gigs. think you have a 512 megabyte SSD. No, and I translated <laughs> that when I said it space. so as not to confuse our listeners. But, but so it's fine. Was, oh, well, do I have, you know, is my drive thrashing? And you got, it, it sounds like you got plenty of free space there. Um, you know, I would lean towards that. I mean, if it's not processor bound, then it could be an IO bound thing. So whether with ISTAT menus or, Activity monitor, look at what's happening as you suggested, Dave. So see how much disk activity. It sounds like a lot of disk activity. Now it could be, I mean, it could be a flaky SSD. So you may want to try one thing here. So that machine also has some, well, not a, not terribly capable ports. So it has SATA three, so six gigabits. So that's good for the internal thing. Um, from what I saw, the external ports I think I think are still USB. Two, though it does have a Thunderbolt, a 10 gig Thunderbolt port and FireWire 800. So <clears throat> I'm wondering if cloning the drive and trying it on any other port. Um, why am I saying this? The thing is, I'm wondering if the SATA is flaky on this machine. OK. OK. Yeah. Or, well, or the drive. Just, just the, it sounds like, you know, I mean, there's a, the, there's different places you can look. So are you are you maxing your processor? He said no. Okay. Well, are you maxing your RAM? And I would assume no. Sixteen gigs is is uh, plenty. Um. So where else is there to look? And that's your storage, right? Even yeah. The fact that he says this doesn't happen with a test user account, though, tells me that it's software, uh, not hardware. Right. That's okay. that's what okay. leads me to that. It could, but I mean, you know, hardware problems are weird things, right? Maybe he tested it in his test user account at a moment when the hardware was behaving. Like. Who knows? So, yeah, it's it's yeah. All right. As for migrating, I'm actually going to share a little piece of advice first, and and then we can talk about migrating. Um, in the if it were mine category, the first thing I would do is spend some time figuring out what the problem is on your old machine, because if you don't know what it is. There is a very, very good chance that you will recreate this problem on your new machine. Um, it, you know, it, you've got something assuming that it is software. And that's why I wanted to do those other tests first. Like if you can rule out software and that it's hardware, pff, no problem. Just, you know, I, at that point, migration assistant, good to go. In fact, if you can figure out what the problem is, and even if it is software, as long as it's software, you can disable and test and confirm that disabling it solves the issue. Again, I would go and do migration assistant. The migration assistant is, is super powerful these days and can save you a lot of headaches. That said, if you want to manually migrate, yes, reinstalling apps, good manually migrating your documents, your photos, your, your music. That's good. The library folder. If you're reinstalling all your apps, I would generally stay away from the library folder, but there is one, at least one specific folder in there, which is home library mail that you're going to want to, uh, to get and move in most cases. And you just move it to the same place on the new machine and the new machine should pick it up when you first launch mail. So those are my general thoughts, John, do you have general thoughts on this? No, I mean, you covered all the bases, you know, clearing out the caches. Uh, that's one thing I would look at. You know, stale caches or broken caches, but uh, he, he claimed to have done that. <sighs> yeah. So no, again, I kind of thought my idea of trying something from a clone is kind of clever, but but again, the the speed of the external ports on that thing may make that yeah unpleasant. 
Well, yep. it has a fire rate hundred. I mean, that's a. Uh, oh, that would be fine. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, it also has, I think, USB 2, so that I probably wouldn't do. But FireWire 800, that... Yep. Yep. So I again, agree. could be this... Uh, yeah. I'm, now that you talk about it more, I don't think it's the SATA, but it could be. You know, could, they, it could you be. Know, try, yeah. try each thing. Yeah. Try different things and, you know... That's it. Yeah, but I would definitely do some more isolation testing just to keep yourself from finding yourself in this exact scenario with the new machine uh, down the road. and. There you go. Yeah. I mean, no. 20 of I mean, that's a pretty good run though. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. I'm not, no, I, I think he is making a good choice to migrate uh, to a new machine. The, the question is, you know, but just don't assume that that's going to, based on what you're telling us, I don't think that's going to be the thing that um, leaves this problem behind necessarily. And that's, that's what you want to avoid. So. All right, uh, moving on to Todd with a, I think it's a quick, quick question. He says, is there any utility or hack out there where you can force a new finder window to always open in column view to show full content width? I have searched, but I have not found a solution. Currently, he says, I double click a column sizer each and every time to set that column to show full content width or right click a column sizer for right size all columns individually. Yeah, this is one of those things where the finder doesn't do exactly what we would want it to do. Um, there is it, the general school of thought uh, that Apple sort of tries to live by, but doesn't is if you open a finder window, set all the, the size of it and the layout and all that and close it, it should save all that. And that's true for some parameters, but not all. And in fact, uh, this is one of them. The column width will always reset to whatever whatever Apple wants to call default. So I'm not sure what the magic answer is here, Todd, but I figured I'd share it here. John, do you have any thoughts? Wait, always open in column view. Yeah, which you can do. But the trick <clears throat> is showing the full content win width of those columns. And that's where you cannot change that, which, and that, that's where it gets frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like there's something here, but not quite. So yeah. So if you go into the finder and you go to uh, show view options in the view menu, it has a little checkbox always open in list right. view. Oh, so close. <laughs> well, but, but no, 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 no. Well, actually it has group by and sort by. I wonder if you fiddle with, no, I think these, uh, no, it doesn't have quite the tag. No, 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 wait, 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 slow down though, because you, you're missing something. The only reason mm -hmm. that when you go to show view options, it says always open in list view is because that window is in list view. But if you change that window to column view uh, mm -hmm. by either going to view as columns or clicking the little widget in the toolbar, assuming you have it. And then go to view show view options. There will be a checkbox that says always open in column view and browse in column view. But what you can't set here is the width of those columns. And that's where it gets frustrating. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm hoping someone else out there knows because it, it, I feel like this is a problem that that maybe some developer has solved with a finder extension or something. So feedback at MacKeyCab.com, please. If you know the answer, I think I heard you right, Dave, you, you, you were asking people to maybe send an email to feedback at MacKeyCab. Right. Uh, yeah. Feedback at MacKeyCab.com is, uh, you know, there you go. That's, that's what, that's where we got to, that's where we'll do it. Yeah. Is it time to move on to Jeremy here? I feel like it might be. What's Jeremy? Uh, let's see. Oh, Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. Jeremy says, uh, uh, where, where do we start this? He says for the past couple of weeks, I've had a weird network issue that I can't explain. I have multiple computers on my network that are hardwired through the router and a LAN dumb switch. Also hardware hardwired are a time capsule, an all in one printer and a Blu-ray player. My issue is that devices only partially communicate. My new Mac mini can see my windows desktop machine and time capsule in the finder but it can't connect to them though time capsule though time machine backups to the time capsule work perfectly. My windows desktop can see the Mac mini, but can't connect to it. 
My work Windows laptop can see my Windows desktop as a computer and a media player. It can even play music from it, though it can't, quote unquote, connect. All three can print to the all-in-one and connect to the internet. I've rebooted the hardware, I've replaced the router and the switch, and disconnecting everything one at a time from the switch and the router, nothing is bringing the communication back. The only thing I haven't tried is to turn off Wi-Fi on the router to see if there's something there causing network confusion, mostly because I haven't figured out how to do that on the router yet. Something else I noticed today says that I don't, I don't know if it has anything to do with this or if it's another issue. In Safari on the Mac Mini, if I click the Show Tab Overview button, my phone and MacBook Air are no longer listed as devices, and the pages from my iPad are at least a couple days old. Though if I look at either the iPad or the iPhone, they have the current sites on the Mini. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so this is this is interesting, and I'm I have a few questions uh, that I would ask if I were sitting there, and I will ask if we're if we're digging into this. The first is, are all the machines getting their IP addresses from the same DHCP server? And have you confirmed that they're all in the same network range? I know th this is this is a very basic question in terms of troubleshooting. The way to do this would be to look in system preferences network on your Mac and in uh, settings Wi-Fi on your iPhone and just take a look at the IP address and make sure it's the one that your router is or in the range that your router is handing out. Um, if somehow they are different, then that's potentially an issue uh, because so much of what you're talking about here has to do with machines that are on the same network. Uh, so that would be the first thing to look at. And then the second thing to look at would be whether any computer out there is using custom DNS servers. Have you gone in and added a DNS server, either on your iPhone, again, settings Wi-Fi or on your Mac, system preferences network, uh, either Wi-Fi or Ethernet there. It, it, are they inheriting default DNS servers from the, the DHCP server that's handing them out, from the router that's handing them out, or have you put something manual in there? Because that can also mess with this as it's trying to connect if it's using the local network names and yet you're forcing it to query, you know, maybe Google or Cloudflare's or whatever, somebody else's, you know, D DNS server, it will not find it. And this probably the least likely scenario, but are you running any apps that would be firewalling things? And have you put anything on your router that firewalls things or that tells it to isolate your Wi-Fi network from your main network? A lot of times if you have a guest network, you can do that and tell it to really isolate all that traffic. That, too, would cause symptoms like this. So any other thoughts on that before we start going into perhaps some workarounds here, John? One diagnostic tool that I think you should use, because it gives you a view of your entire network, is our pal thing. So one tool you want to add to your uh, toolbox here, and there are versions for both iOS and Mac, though I think the Mac is only command line, but... um. It'll give you an idea of all the devices and tell you if there's anything wrong, if they're not. It sounds like there's just something not quite configured properly here. Yeah, I'm I'm assuming um, when he says connect and that he can't mm -hmm. connect, that he's in the finder, seeing the item in the shared section uh, or the device. I guess it would be the shared section, uh, you know, in the finder sidebar, clicking on it and then unable to effectively you know complete a connection to mount those drives right that that's what i'm assuming here but of course if i'm misassuming that then then the path we're heading down is completely wrong but um if if that doesn't work try a manual connection and that in the finder is with the you go to the go menu uh, you know at the top of the finder there and choose connect to server in here I would type in SMB colon slash slash and then the IP address of the computer that you're trying to connect to. We'll worry about network names later, but seek if you know the IP address and if you manually tell your computer, here's the IP address, can you connect? Is there something preventing the actual connection from happening or is it just the lookup that's not quite happening right all the time? That would that would be the the first thing I'd try. And if SMB is the sort of the standard now. I think that's been standard since what Sierra, maybe 
Um, but you could also try instead of SMB colon slash slash, you could try AFP, Apple File Protocol colon slash slash. That's the older sort of deprecated method of file sharing amongst Macs. But, uh, you know, would be worth trying because it should still be supported by any OSs you're running. Um, uh, and that would that would be that would be the trick. And it, uh, sort of a bonus tip, if you want to connect and screen share to a machine, it, you can do exactly the same thing in the finder. Go connect to server. And instead of typing SMB or AFP, you type VNC colon slash slash and then the IP address and you get to connect. So. Um, so anyway, there you go. Any any thoughts on that, John? One last thing to add here is you want to make sure that you have the protocols you think you have enabled enabled and where do you see that well i'm going to tell you where dave system preferences sharing now if you pr if you click on file sharing okay well there's a little checkbox but then there's also an options button and that's where as you mentioned you can say share files using smp or share files using afp yep you may want to look there and just see what you have selected what you have selected may not be what you think you have selected same thing on the windows side but i think windows side is pretty much smb so <laughs> right Right. Yeah. But fair. Making sure that it's that it's actually sharing files is a good place to start. Yeah. yeah. The other thing last I checked is Fing will let you it does like a, a little port scan of the devices on your network. So if you want to know, oh, well, how are you sharing stuff? Well, you know, highlight the device and then nice. I forget exactly what the choice is. Right. But but in, no, I know it's there. I think you can say, you know, show me all the services you're offering. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Ah, just make I like sure that. everybody's. Offering, you know, SMB, AFP, VNC, whatever. That, yep. it, it shows it all. It so. should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's possible. He didn't say what kind of router he's using. It might be that time capsule, though. Uh, if it is, then that shouldn't be blocking connections. But if it's not, there could be something in the router that's blocking those connections. Um, <clears throat> like I said, it's totally possible. It's just. You know. I mean, he says now, the other, you know, that occurred to me, too. I mean, the thing is, ports on switches go bad. And especially cheap switches, right? Or cheap anything. Things sure. Like um, but he says he replaced the router. Now, I don't know yeah. if it's his ISP's router. It sounds like it's his ISP's because he says there's Wi-Fi in it. So I'm, I'm assuming we're talking a, a vendor-provided product here. Is well, my, my routers have Wi-Fi in them, right? So I think that's okay. pretty normal. Yeah, yours does. Mine, mine doesn't. But your your router doesn't have Wi-Fi in it? Yeah, you run Eero, right? That's your router. That's your Wi-Fi. No, you're right. Okay. Yeah, it's not vendor provided, but no, no. Right, right. I know what you're saying. Yeah, okay. Right. So, yeah. I Yeah. It. It's it's one of those interesting things. It's no, I'm those... sorry, but he said he has a switch as well. So I'm wondering if the switch is doing something weird. Mm. I mean, it sounds like he said he replaced this. He swapped. Well, I think he said he swapped out both. And... Yep. Yep. And it didn't, didn't seem to make a difference. routers can go bad, you know. Absolutely. Uh, the troubleshooting process, though, is, you know, plug things into different ports and see if anything changes. That's right. Yep. Yep. And, and I've seen switches go bad. Uh, you know, of course, here it's always lightning because that's what causes all our problems. But mm -hmm. um, I, I've seen them go bad to where they light up and say they're connected, you know, like all good and no data passes. I don't I can't say that I've ever seen one that would filter certain types of data. But, you know, anything's possible. With a hardware problem. Yeah. I mean, that's weird. I mean, that's that's pretty advanced stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, look at this. Okay. So I'm running Thing here, and I'm looking at devices on my network. And, uh, yep, here's one here. And it's, uh, yeah, it says show open ports. Wow, that's handy. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. It's good. All right. Hey, I want to, uh, speaking of Eero, I want to take a minute and talk about our next sponsor, which is Eero. And I actually, even if you are an already an Eero user, I have an Eero related tip uh, that came up earlier today, believe it or not, that I'm going to share at the end. But, um, you know, the beauty of Eero is that for most of us, the single router model just doesn't work, right? Not only because of the range we need in our homes, but because of the high bandwidth that we need, right? The way routers work, they really, especially with Macs, can only talk to one device at a time. Well, if you've got a lot of people streaming in your house, you might need more than one device talking at a time or receiving or listening at a time. And this is where Mesh can really help. This is, to me, sort of the hidden place where Mesh helps, because even if you've got enough 
coverage range, you might not have enough coverage bandwidth. And this is where mesh can really, really help you. Very, very cool. And a distributed system like Eero is exactly what you need. Offices have had it for years because they have high density environments. Our homes are now those same high density environments with not just our Macs and our iPhones and our watches and our IoT devices and all of that good stuff. And current routers are tough to manage and optimize, especially when you start adding extras to help your coverage. No, 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 no. This is the beauty of Mesh with Eero because the Eero app lets you manage your entire network from the palm of your hand. You don't have to worry about managing different devices and getting them to work together. Eero does that part for you. Everything is managed from one interface. Very, very cool stuff. And their customer support is stellar. It's pretty good to be able to call and get a human on the phone. Let me tell you, and this is how customer support works with Eero. Well, Eero also has Eero Plus, which is designed to provide simple, reliable security that defends all your home's devices against all the threats that are out there, like malware and spyware and phishing attacks, as well as unsuitable content. The combination of Eero with Eero Plus combines all of this together for complete protection for your network and all of your devices and everyone who uses them are protected as they connect to the internet. Total network protection, advanced security, right? Checks the sites you visit against a database of millions of known threats, content blocking, Eero Plus automatically tags sites that contain violent, illegal adult content. So you can choose whether or not you want to let your family members or your kids get to those Ad blocking, if you've got a site that's going nuts on that, it's right there. VPN protection built in from Encrypt.me. Password management from 1Password. Antivirus software from Malwarebytes. All of this included in Eero Plus. So here's the deal. Eero Plus works super well. I've got it running here. I've got it running at my dad's house. Every week, I get a note that says how much was blocked. I can go in and look at the details it's super cool. John's running it too. It really works. So you got to check it out. Go to eero.com slash MGG. This is where you can go to never have to think about Wi-Fi again. You get a hundred bucks off the Eero base unit with two beacons. So you get a three unit mesh package with one year of Eero plus at eero.com slash MGG. Again, you go to Eero.com slash MGG, you get a hundred bucks off the Eero base unit and two beacons package plus one year of Eero plus Eero.com slash MGG is where you go. And then at checkout, you enter promo code MGG. That's how this works. Super cool. And our thanks to Eero for sponsoring this episode. Now, I promised you all that I had a little bonus tip for Eero users. Eero's been adding a lot of cool features in their betas uh, or in their beta labs, I guess I should call it. Over the last year, these features do not get turned on automatically. One of the best features is Eero's SQM, their smart queue management. This is their uh, WAN based QoS, which is the thing that we talk about a lot here. It totally keeps you from having an issue with your bandwidth when you've got one device that's like barfing a backup or sending pictures up to the cloud or whatever. So you definitely want to go and you're in the Eero app. You go to the hamburger menu in the upper left, go to network settings, go all the way to the bottom and go to uh, Eero labs beta and turn on smart queue management. There's two other things there, band steering and local DNS caching, local DNS caching keeps uh, lets the router remember lookups that you've done for for uh, dns stuff and if it's within the time limit and it hasn't expired it will just keep it right there you definitely want to do this stuff turn on local dns caching lastly band steering normally your device picks whether it connects to the eros 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz radio with band steering eero helps decide and it will put more devices on your 5 gigahertz network where there's more bandwidth and things can move a little more freely. So I recommend turning all these things on. I assume, do you have all yours on, John, with that? Mm hmm I yep. figured as much. Yeah. Cool. I yeah. think I had to shut them off one time. Sometimes some of these features will confuse some security software. Okay. Yeah, fair. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or no, benchmarking software. No, I had it the other day. I think I was doing a DNS bench and it was like, um, your router is doing something weird and I can't do it. And I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, so yeah, because of that off. DNS caching. That would make sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. So it was like, I can't do this because you got something in the way. But, right. Um, yeah, easy sense. enough to turn it on and off uh, whenever you want. Uh, that's um, pretty good. Actually, I just noticed on my network settings screen and updates available. These guys just keep updating like, all oh, the time. There you go. Yeah, it's time and to fine tuning their product. And I have never heard of somebody call that the hamburger menu. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, that's a designer term. I've heard tons of designers call it that. I've it's, never heard that. Yeah, I mean, it looks just, like a it looks like a Big Mac or, right. or a hamburger. Three know? lines. You've got the bun <laughs> and the hamburger in the middle. Yeah. I don't know. That's what I, I I don't know what else to call that. Right. That thing in the corner. I don't know. It's that thing in the corner. <laughs> it's that thing in the corner, man. Yeah. Hey. Uh, all right. Moving on to. Um, so I hope you folks don't mind that I, I took a little extra time with that sponsor spot because I wanted to because it because it because it didn't because it wasn't the sponsor spot anymore. It was just us sharing tips. And it actually came up earlier today. Helped a friend solve a problem. Hadn't turned any of those things on. It's like, yeah. There you go. They're not on by default. So it's good to check them. Anyway, um, Rod has a question relates Hi, to all this. It's been a while. Yeah. He says, uh, I know you've talked about this in the past and maybe there's a particular show that answers my question. No, no. It's always good. Uh, he says, I'd like to know more about Wi-Fi speeds. It is my understanding that whatever package the cable company sells us, 300 down, 20 up, etc. your actual internet speeds when wired through the wired ethernet port uh, will be that, but close will be that or close to that. Uh, and he says, now, when it comes to Wi-Fi, I'm a bit lost. I've been told a number of things by people I suspect are trying to CYA. Uh, in my most recent situation, he says, <laughs> I've signed up for a thousand down and 20 up. Okay. He says, however, the Wi-Fi speed test results on my iPhone 10 S are between 200 and 300 down and about 19 up. The guys installing told me two things. Number one, there's a limit on what Wi-Fi can do. Uh, he says, I know this is true, just not why and how. And number two, something having to do with the back and forth from the router modem and my phone somehow means I should double the speeds or half the speeds I'm seeing. Uh, he says, which is still below the thousand down that I should be getting if I take the 200 to 300 and double it to 600. He says, I think this is a lot of BS. If you don't already have a show explaining this for simpletons to understand, would you mind doing so? We would never mind doing so. And, and this isn't, mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason to call anyone a simpleton. It's it, this stuff's crazy and convoluted. And when you get mixed messages, it's hard to decipher them. So let's start at the beginning. What he got was all BS, but some BS, but right? some, well, and certainly not some in a of what package. They said was true. Some of what they said was true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it also doesn't necessarily apply. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about what applies here. And you're totally right that the paid for slash advertised speed of your connection uh, is should be close to what you get when you connect via Ethernet. Um, you know, for example, uh, some providers like like Comcast or Xfinity, they actually over provision the cable modem. So like I get I'm supposed to get um, one. I, I think I, it's gigabit down and. Uh, and 35 up, but it's provisioned at 1.2 gigabits or gigawatts uh, down and, uh, and 42 up. And so sometimes on my upstream speed tests, I'll actually get more than my 35, but it's right in that range. You're totally right. Wi-Fi is a different story. Um, yeah. Now, one thing I just noticed this here is that, because you're going to be talking about bottlenecks, so I'm sorry to steal your thunder. Here, mm. But I just noticed something is that he has 1,000 down. What does that mean? That's a gigabit. And Correct. that's the speed of the port in most computers here. So I'm just, I, I, I never thought we'd see this day where you could get internet speeds faster than the speed of your ethernet port. Well, that's what I just case, said. Mine, mine is yeah. provisioned at 1.21 gigabits per second down. I don't have a device to do that. Like, you know, so you don't have, well, wait, don't you have a 10? Oh, no, no, not on yeah. my cable modem. No. Right. Your Mac mini has 10 gig, right? It could. It did? does not. I chose not to buy it with it. Oh. Um, but, okay. but my cable modem does not have 
a 10 gigabit port. Now, th- not, nor does it have the ability to bond Ethernet ports together. So you can't get more than a gigabit. Right, out right. Of it. No, but, I'm just pondering that yeah. we're getting to the age here. And I assume this is fiber. I mean, it would almost have to be. Well, no, uh, no I'm on a cable. He's on a cable modem connection. That's the whole point of Doxus 3.1 is you can you can do this on the downstream. And if but it's if, interesting if, to see if he were on offered speeds at the speed of ports on the machine or that the ports are now having greater capabilities kind of yeah. looking towards the future. Yeah. Yeah. No, if he were on fiber, it would be synchronous. So he would get gig in both directions, which is what a lot of people do. <laughs> right, right. Um, all right. So let's talk about your Wi-Fi speeds. And, and as John said, it, you know, it is all based on the weakest link of the chain. So just like I can't get 1.21 gigabits, I really want to say gigawatts, uh, gigawatts rather. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I just like I can't get that because my Ethernet connection won't go faster than 1000 or 1. 1.0 gigabits. Uh, your Wi-Fi connection can also be the weak link in the chain. It didn't used to be this way. When our Internet connection speeds were, say, 50 megabits down and five up, our Wi-Fi speeds were generally fast enough to to go, you know, to not be the weak link. Our our connection from the outside world was the weak link in the chain. That's not the case anymore with gigabit connections. Wi-Fi is often the limiting factor, and I'm pretty sure that's true here for you, Rod. So um, there's a couple ways to look at this, and I'm just, I'm just going to pick one protocol to drill down on. You can sort of apply what we're going to talk about here to any of them. But um, let's say you're doing this on your iPhone, right? And you're connected, your router is some, you know, kick butt, dual band, quad stream router. Okay. What that means is that your router has two radios, dual band, one each at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. And that each radio has the potential to use four antennas, streams, quad stream, four antennas simultaneously. Okay, great. These days, 5 gigahertz generally means 802.11 AC. And we're, we're going to ignore Wi-Fi 6 or any of that for now. Like I said, we're just going to focus on Wi-Fi 5 or whatever. I think it's Wi-Fi 5, 802.11ac, where each stream theoretically is capable of 433 megabits per second. Now you say, but my router has four streams, and that means 1,732 megabits per second because of multiplication. And you're right. But there are two tricks to consider here. One, that's the theoretical speed. And number two, and this is where you sort of cut things in half. It's different with every protocol, but by and large, let's say we cut it in half. Okay, great. So you say, great, Dave, we cut it in half. That's 866 megabits. Why am I only getting two to 300? Well, there's a reason for that too. While your router might have four streams, sometimes called a four by four router, your iPhone does not. It has two streams. It is a dual stream device. It is a two by two device. So that means each stream, 433 megabits a second times two equals 866 theoretical maximum, generally the real world max of 433. Now, as I said, this is not necessarily uh, this cut in half thing doesn't really apply with 802.11ac the way it has with others. Uh, You can get speeds up over 500 megabits per second in a real world test. I've seen it. I see it pretty routinely. If I'm really close to my router and there's no other interference. So you're seeing two to 300 could be the distance from the router. It could be other interference in the range, but that's not entirely rare. Uh, Somewhere in that two to 400 range is what is seen most of the time for an iPhone connecting to, uh, you know, a, a router in, in general scenarios. So what you're seeing is totally normal. And until you change your iPhone will not change. And you can, you could change to another iPhone, but there are no iPhones that support more than two streams. In fact, most Macs don't support more than two streams. Uh, Mm. The, the iMacs are three stream devices, MacBook pros after a certain vintage are three stream devices. And I believe the new Mac mini and new MacBook air are three stream devices, if I'm not mistaken, but, Mm. but by and large dual stream is, is what is put in Wi-Fi chips, especially mobile Wi-Fi chips where your battery life is 
is important and, and all that the good stuff that may change. And of course with Wi-Fi six, it all is going to change anyway, but, um, but that that's typically how it goes. So that's why you're getting the speed you're seeing and what you're seeing totally makes sense. And I don't think there's anything wrong. Hopefully that helps not just Rod, but lots of you thoughts right. on this, John. Now there are some things you could do. Now, one, you, you, the point that you make is excellent is that whereas wired connections in theory, you can get the full speed of each port on a wired connection. Uh, if you're plugged into a switch that, you know, is built properly. Whereas you're always going to be splitting up among everybody with Wi-Fi, as you stated, you, you got the, the limit to radios, number of radios, right? Is that you go, you don't get all the streams. And then the thing is you have all your other devices. So the thing is you're not getting undivided attention. Right. Device. Well, you may not it, be getting it, it, undivided it gets, attention. It, it gets better with a mesh product because it can kind of, you know, distribute it. Just like we said. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But um, the other thing that occurs to me, just to mention one thing that I see sometimes, um, there's a certain room in my house where when I use my iPhone and I use the Eero software, which is great for this, and most routers, uh, Wi-Fi routers will support you seeing this. What frequency are you connected at? Because there's one room in my house, Dave, where my iPhone is always connected at 2.4. I think it's because there's tile in it. It's, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So the thing is, whenever I do a speed test in that room, it's always going to be terrible because it's like, uh, I, I can't do five gigahertz. It's, it's not a good idea. I'm going to give you 2.4. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just the Euro or the phone making that decision. I don't know who's making it. I think it's, it's between the two of them. Right. Yeah. Um, in with Eero, well, it depends on whether you have band steering on or not. I do have it on, and I think band steering, yeah, as you said, I, I, it, it tries its best to get you on yeah. five, if it makes sense. Well, but it, if it, it chooses what it, it participates in the decision process. Your phone definitely has its its vote, but the router can tell the phone what it sees. And really, that whole band steering thing, the cool part about it is your phone can see which connection is strongest. It, that's what it uses to choose. Right. It's like if the 2.4 connection is stronger, I'm just going to go with that. The router, however, gets to say, well, wait a minute. Yes, 2.4 might be stronger for you. But even at your weaker connection, this five gigahertz channel is going to get you more bandwidth, either because it's just going to be faster or it's less congested, which is something your phone cannot know. And it's like, yeah, no, you, there's like all these other devices on the 2.4. Jump over to five. Trust me, it's going to be better. That's what band steering really does. So, Got it. yeah, which is kind of cool. I mean, it it's what it should mm -hmm. be, right? All, everything should be con communicating and conversing and making the right decision, not just sort of mm -hmm. a, an uninformed decision that our devices can make. So, yeah. All right. Um, all right. Seems like we're on the networking show. So let's jump to Joe here who says, uh, he says, I recently read an article about different DNS servers, publicly usable DNS servers. And he says, I drew the conclusion that using Cloudflare at 1.1.1.1 might be a good idea. He says, I listened to back to episode 730 where you talked about this and I'm not sure whether I should go ahead. And if I do, should I set it up on the router? or on my Mac individually? And will it interfere with uh, my Synology configuration where I have devices accessible from outside my network? Um, so to answer the last question first, generally no. Uh, whatever you set your outbound DNS to will not affect your anything coming in. Your IP address coming in is still the same. So however those devices are getting through, even if it's dynamic DNS, yes, it's all DNS, but separate and you're all good. Whether or not you should use Cloudflare. So there are many publicly usable DNS servers. John, you mentioned that utility name bench that you like to use that will tell you which is the best one or at least the fastest one for you. Uh, Google's is 8.8.8.8. .8 I think, was it IBM that's 9.9.9.9 now? And then Cloudflare is 1.1.1.1. I have found in in sort of general usage cases, I've found that Cloudflare's is the best. Uh, in general, again, there's you know lots of specifics. Namebench can help you here, although it too can be misleading. Um, Cloudflare also has a very cool iOS app that they call the 1.1.1.1 app that makes it really easy for you to use their DNS and to use it in an encrypted way by setting up a VPN. The VPN only 
is used for DNS. All your connections otherwise are just sent over it. That's what we were talking about back in episode 730. But um, but yeah, Cloud uh, Cloudflare does a good job. They they and they they really have the interests of the internet in mind uh, as much as any company can, uh, you know, within reason. So, thoughts on this, John? Um. Oh. All I can say is, yeah, so I'm, I, I forgot who I put in the last time I ran this uh, name bench. And actually, I think name bench is still in, it's in a weird state right now. Yeah. Um, I had problems running the GUI on top of it, but I think if you run it, if you use like a package manager and you, you run it from the command line, okay, it, it'll still okay. do the job. That, the, the last time I ran it, I had to do that because yeah, the GUI, there's something wrong with it. Or just doesn't show you the results, you know, which is kind of the point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's right. like, yeah, fast, yeah. second, fast. But the thing I want to, mention to people is whenever you set up a DNS, uh, especially on, on a router, but most people would, would say that setting the DNS value on your router and then having it propagate by a D by a DHCP is probably the best way to go. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, have a backup DNS server. The thing is in a lot of places you can put not only a primary DNS, but a backup one in case the first one fails, which, Hey, things fail. So, right. Um, just keep that in mind when you're configuring your computer. And I think that was there also a question. Well, um, oh, oh, that was he the, asked question. the question. Yes. Yeah. He asked the question, should I set it up on my Mac? And I would say, no, I, I would say set it up all, all on the router just for ease of administration. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would do that. Well, I, I, yes, I would set it up on your router. Definitely. Um, when you're at home, having your Mac and or all your devices use your router's DNS server can, if we circle back to, you know, one of the first questions we answered here, uh, that would uh, help mitigate any issues where you might not be able to, say, connect to another server locally on your network, right? Like having all your devices use your router's DNS and then have the router use Cloudflare or whatever else you choose to use, mm -hmm. that, that would definitely be the right thing. However... There are scenarios where you're going to want to do this manually on your Mac. And one of them would be if you're out and about and you want to make sure you're using Cloudflare's DNS, then you would need to configure that there. And you can, like I said, and for your iPhones, you can use their app and they make it really easy. So, so yeah, yeah. But, but I would put it on your router for sure. Yeah. Um, All right. John, you, you don't, I don't think you know this, but you may, but um, we just started using Cloudflare for our DNS and not our DNS lookups, but our DNS hosting. Uh, we have for the last mm, 17 years been hosting our own DNS. We've run a server uh, called bind. Well, I think we started with name D and then moved to bind, but um, it, there were some, our, there were some reasons that we wanted to change that. And, uh, and I started looking and Cloudflare actually has a really cool DNS hosting option. It, it is available for free to anybody that wants it. So if you're hosting your own DNS for, you know, for example, if you have uh, your own uh, website or something, you might be hosting your DNS uh, at your provider or something. And that can be fine. But Cloudflare is very connected to the roots of the internet in terms of their DNS. So things work a lot faster through them or can work a lot faster through them. So, uh, so we started hosting our DNS there and they can also do things even on their free plan. You can get benefits of their content delivery network and some caching so that if your website starts to get overloaded, they'll actually sort of help buffer that for you again, even for free. Uh, then of course, because this is how Cloudflare works. This is how generally business works. They have things you can pay for if you want to use more and more of their services. But their freemium model is very much a, a functional thing. It's what we're using there, uh, at least at the moment. And um, and and like I said, you know, they they have there, there's some altruism here. They have the best interests of the internet at heart. And by helping to solve these problems, they kind of make everything better. And and again, then they have, you know, the things that they can do for you to help you and, and you can pay for it. But, um, but yeah, yeah, we moved to that this week and it's been or end of last week, I should say super smooth sailing. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think I'm running, I think I'm running them as my primary and I think I'm running open DNS as my secondary. Mm. Uh, that seems to have been working for, um, 
Well, huh? Last time I changed it. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. All right. I, I want to take, we have a couple of questions that you prepped, John. And before we do that, I want to take a minute and thank our next sponsor, which is LinkedIn Jobs. We're at linkedin.com slash MGG. You can connect to the, it really, you know, I, the way I like to describe this is they have, LinkedIn has an unfair competitive advantage. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're looking to hire someone, you want to find the right person. You don't necessarily want to only be able to pick from the pool of people that are actively seeking a new job, right? You want to be able to target your approach and get anyone that might be open to new opportunities, even if they haven't gone and posted their resume out on some job board yet. Well, this is where LinkedIn has a leg up because 70% of the U S workforce is on LinkedIn and everybody's resume is right there. And because of that, LinkedIn can really help to tailor your search for the right people and can even get to people who have expressed that. Yes, they're open to new opportunities, even though they're not like out there pounding the pavement every day, looking for a new job. This is why I say LinkedIn has this unfair competitive advantage because you want to find the right person, not just the right person that's actively looking. This is why you want to use LinkedIn. And here's the cool part. You can go to linkedin.com slash MGG and get 50 bucks off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash MGG to get $50 off your first job post. I have used LinkedIn. I have hired people on LinkedIn and I have done that in a scenario where I've spent less than that $50. So this isn't just, you know, like 50 bucks and you're going to have to pay a lot more. No, no. If you play your cards right, like this 50 bucks might get you your next hire. So you got to check it out. LinkedIn.com slash MGG to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply, of course, as always. <laughs> and uh, our thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you want to take us to uh, to Jim? Yeah, I will. But, you know, I had uh, I had two encounters via LinkedIn in the last week, Dave. One was an old colleague and one was somebody I met at a gathering. I went oh, to nice. it was both like. One contacted me through LinkedIn, you know, saying, hey, let's, you know, hook up and, uh, you know, reminisce. And another was someone that I didn't know worked in the same company that I did years ago. And it's like, well, how are you going to link up LinkedIn? LinkedIn. Yeah, there you go. All right. Yeah. So Jim has an interesting one. And I don't know what to think of this, Dave. Okay. You'll tell me what you think of it. So, I will. It's what we do. Jim writes, I'm trying to transition from Evernote to Apple's Notes app, but I am running into a problem. When I try and save a multi-page PDF to Notes... I only get the first page to show up. It seems to happen in both iOS and Mojave. My iOS devices, I'm using the print function from the share menu, then expanding resulting document to get the options to save to Evernote, Dropbox, Notes, etc. On my Macs, I'm using the print to notes function. For both Evernote and Dropbox, I get the full multi-page PDF, but for notes, only the first page shows up as a saved PDF. Any idea on how to get the full PDF into notes? I think it's Jim... I think that's already happening. I'm going to tell you why I say that. You may think I'm insane, but let, let me try to convince you otherwise. Well, I think it, the two aren't mutually exclusive. Let's just yes. set that. Thank okay, you. sure. Thanks, yeah. friend. You can, you're right. I mean, you can be right, and Jim can also be correct. So there you go. I could be right, or I could be crazy. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Anyways, um, I think he may have either found a bug in the Notes app, Dave. Or if that's the way they want to deploy it, which gives me a fist shake. And I think actually he responded to my my reply and uh, shook his fist at Apple as well, because I think this is the way they want it to work. But I tried on my Mac, Dave. So I had a PDF. I opened it up, went to the share menu and said, share to notes. OK, and then I go to notes and sure enough, there's a PDF that shows up in notes and I click on it and there's the first page. And that's the only page I see. Okay, so same thing it's that Jim's like, well, uh, Yeah. Now, my ex expectation would be that if you hit like an arrow or you scroll or something, you would see the additional pages. I'm like, well, what's going on here? This this, this is like lame. Um, but then there's a number of options within the notes program. And here's what I found, Dave. So if I right click on the PDF embedded in notes and choose quick look attachment, 
because it considers it an attachment. I saw all the pages. I'm like, huh? Uh, but it looks like you're still in the notes app. Now, there's also another option if you bring up the contextual menu called open in preview. And sure enough, if you say that, Dave, it also opens it up and you see all the pages. Finally, uh, in the embedded PDF, if you click on the uh, pull down in the upper right, there's something called markup, which is Apple's kind of mini document editor, I guess. And it's like, hey, you want to open this a markup? And I'm like, sure. And it's like, same thing. Saw all the pages. So when you export the document, as far as I can tell, Dave, uh, all the pages are put into the PDF, but Notes is somehow making a decision to just show you the first page. And that's why I think we got to get, get a fish shake going here. Because to me, that's just not good so there's no Design. visual there's no visual indication that there is more to see here unless you know to look for that. Is that not that I could see? No, huh. no, yeah, that's I, I explored cool. a PDF and it just showed me the first page. And it's right. like, OK, and the, but the document is there in that if you offload it, the if right. you offload it to another app, it shows you all the pages. So the document. Is, so you, yeah. you can use notes. To store your PDFs, but you can't really effectively view them with the notes native interface. You've got to either hand it off to markup or like I said, or hand it off to preview or, or yeah, right. Look, right. You've got to, like, but you have what? to dig to find out if there might even be something more and then you'll see it. Yeah. That's not good. I, I'm not into that. So yeah, notes I, is, <laughs> I want to love notes. I, I like, and I, I will say this when we were at CES, I, we use Evernote here, right, uh, for Mac Geek Gab, and it shares our notes. And I generally use Evernote for sort of everything that I need to capture. Well, their iOS app has changed because I used to be able to, uh, like, go to one of these, you know, Pepcom events or even just, you know, a general trade show. And I would create one note for the show and I could just whip open my phone and tap Evernote and get right in and start typing about, you know, whatever thing it was I just learned. And I wanted to save some mm -hmm. some data. This time, something must have happened in the Evernote update since maybe October, which is the last time I went to an event and used it. And uh, in this way, anyway, every time I launch Evernote, I see my note, I go to type and Evernote's like, whoa, man, slow down. I got to refresh everything. And it takes like 10 or 15 seconds and refreshes everything, then displays me my note again, where I can tap and start to edit and all that. And it's not been this way before. And it was, it got to the point very, very quickly at, at CES where it was like, okay, this is non-functional. And I used notes and notes worked exactly the way I wanted. Um, but, you know, notes doesn't let us share entire notebooks like we do for Mac Geek Gab. You can share individual notes, but you can't share entire notebooks. So there's some non-starters with it for just some, you know, uh, more uh, business related workflows, I would, I guess I would say, but. Uh, but otherwise, you know, no, there's a lot to love about notes. I just wish some of these other I, things were right there because I'd like to, I'd I think I'd like using it. Yeah. I use it on almost a daily basis and, and I keep track of, a, a, you would almost say, John, why don't you use reminders? And the thing is I probably should, but for a lot of things that are date based and like task based, I'll do a little task list and notes. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah, notes. The dates. It, there's some nice stuff in there. Yeah. Like for, um, yeah, and for other things, I use the, the app itself. Like, for example, Calendar. I use Calendar to schedule my bill payments every month. Sure. And I have a little item saying, okay, well, you know, I've got to pay these people about this date. And then, and then, you know, schedule it and do my bill pay and everything's cool. And Calendar, doing a text note in Calendar is the best way for me to, yep. you know, because of the notification. But for other things, you know, lists of, uh, you know, like my stock trades, I do that. You know, mm. things where I want a history and and see dates or I put the dates in myself. Sure. But, uh but yeah, in, in this one case, I, I would say notes is a wee bit lacking. Yep. Yep. There's just some some things. And then why would you only want to see the first page of a PDF? Huh? I mean, who even made that decision? Right. Well, and this is if this you is made where that it decision, gets, you can send an oh, I'm sorry. No, this <laughs> yeah, is where it gets frustrating <laughs> with um this is where it gets frustrating with with Apple's sort of you know, built in apps because by creating something like notes they really do discourage anyone else from trying to enter this market, right? Because it, everyone that, that has a Mac or an iPhone automatically has notes with iCloud, it automatically syncs. So you really have to offer something compelling to get people, 
to use your product instead of the one that's built in for free and guaranteed to work when upgrades happen. Right. And, and you know, this is where I feel like Apple, they, they fall short, right? Calendar software was the same way for a long time until people finally figured out, Oh no, 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 no. Like there really is a market for third party calendars because Apple's calendar app is so weak. I don't mean to say that it's bad for you. I just mean to say that it's a weak app. And for many people, but not certainly not everyone, for many people, the limitations, the walls that they've created there uh, are, you know, are non-functional and notes is that way too. But I, you know, is that, should Apple even be playing in this arena or should they completely get out of it? So as to open up the space and let third parties really do meaningful stuff mm -hmm. here. I, it, you know, it's, it's a tough, no, with, it's a tough balance. The calendar, yeah. The calendar point is interesting because I mean, Apple themselves came up as far as I know with the iCal standard, right? And they they came up with the, the Cal, the CalDAV standard. Or CalDAV. Yeah. Well, one or, guy, or they, were Red, part of the, or they were part of the group. They, no, they no, no. Do. Red, Red Dutta, when he worked at Apple, oh, yeah. he, he made CalDAV. Um, and, and I think he might still be the only human on the planet that truly understands it. <laughs> Unfortunately, he retired. So, you know, bear that in mind. But no, no, no. There's other people. We, I, I was involved in a project for a while where we were doing a lot with CalDAV and it was like, oh, holy crap. Like nobody really understands how this works. But um, but yeah, no, they they created that and CardDAV. I think they also created CardDAV, too, for sharing contacts. But certainly CalDAV was them. They may, CardDAV may not have been. All right. But, um, but yeah, but like, it's like, you know, they, like you said, I mean, that's amazing, right? They did this thing to make it open source and it, thank goodness they did because now something like BusyCal or Fantastical can connect to iCloud servers and it's the right protocols and all that stuff. And you can still all see the same data and, and, you know, it's great, but with calendar just existing there, yeah, you know, Apple's they're, they're sort of stuck, right? Because if they didn't offer a calendar app, people would lambaste them. And they do offer an a calendar app, but it's not full featured enough and they don't seem to put enough into it. So and it sort of blocks a lot of the market, but thankfully not all of it. And, and you get things like busy Cal and fantastic Cal. So you have options, which is great. The notes markets the same way. It's like, eh, yeah. So anyway, I don't know. All right. Uh, you want to take us to On Paul? To yeah. Another one here. Yeah. Now this one, oh, this one's kind of wacky, but let's see where we can go with Paul here. So Paul writes in. It says, hi. hi. <laughs> In light of the FaceTime issue, here is another weird one for you. I did a clean install of Mojave on a Mac Mini and copied some data files over from another Mac. I also logged into my iCloud account. In my services menu, when right-clicking on a file in the Finder on the Mac Mini, are BB Edit services. Not sure why they're there. I've never installed BB Edit on this machine. Nonetheless, when I use this service... <coughs> Excuse me. It opens BB Edit from somewhere. BB Edit is not my applications folder. This works even when disconnected from the internet. I then I tried the same with Cot Editor, C O T Editor. Okay, I've never used that. For the first time, when not connected to the internet, C O T Editor opened. How did this app get on my Mac? And where are they? Spotlight can't find them. They are not in Launchpad. Scary. Oh, that's kind of scary. Well, okay, so, so I uh, want to answer the first question, though. If an app launch, just so anyone, everyone knows, if an app app launches and it's sitting there in your dock and you don't know where it came from, your Mac will tell you. Right click on the app, go to options and say show in finder. Right. So, right. That's going to show you where it is. No question. Like guaranteed. So at least there's that. Because otherwise, this the is option kind of here. Show. Ah, there we go. Yes, you're right. Okay. So something that's running in the dock. Yep. Option. Show and finder. All right. So how do you identify, how do you drill down or find out what's happening here? The thing is, it has to be on maybe not your hard drive, but it could be on another attached hard drive. Was that, that, that actually, yeah. Dave, that was the thought in the back of my mind is that you have a backup drive mounted and it's getting confused. Absolutely. And this is why I, and I'm sorry to keep stepping in here, but I, I'm excited. No, no, fine. No, um, this is why well, I too, highly, we're trying to solve this. that's it. This is why I highly recommend when you do a clone that you eject your clone after the cloning operation and, and things like carbon copy cloner, let you check a box that ejects your clone because I always if, do that yeah, immediately. If you, if you don't, Otherwise. 
you could have like you could install a, an update to BB Edit. Let's say you clone once a week or whatever. You install an update. It could run the old one potentially from your clone drive if it's just hanging out online and yeah, not or you can pull up an old version of a document. Even worse, right? So eject those clones other than while they are cloning. That's it. So sorry. So you may have so look in your um you may have it hidden, but um. There should be uh what is it locations I guess in the sidebar and and if you click on locations it may say hide it may say show but then it should show all of your various mounted network volumes and uh, take it from there but to dig a little deeper here Dave so did a little detective work here because it was really kind of fun it's like how do you find where this stuff is located it has to be located somewhere otherwise it wouldn't run right first thing if you want to find an application. I think the best thing to do, Dave, is to run system information. How do you do that, you may ask? Well, you go to the Apple menu, and you hold down the option key, and then the thing that says about this Mac is going to convert to something called system information, dot, dot, dot. You highlight that, then you run something, and then you'll get a, it will run something called system information. And this will give you a plethora of data about your Mac, more than you'd ever want to know. But the place that you want to go to, Dave, is that there are major and minor categories here. And they have a hardware category. Don't care about that. Network, don't care about that. Oh, software. And then if you go to software, there's an applications category. What you want to do is click on that. It's going to take a while. It's going to rip through your hard drive or other connected things. And then tell you about every application that you have installed along with where it is. And I think that is going to be the uh, thing of value here. Yeah. I'm going to assume it's going to show up there. So you're going to see BB edit somewhere in that list. And if you don't, then I don't know, get back to us. Um, right. The other thing you could try, Dave is um seeing weird things in the services menu. Now this, I, this, I kind of did a curveball here or a hail Mary, or I don't know, but um, it seems to work, Dave. So, um, if you want to find out more about a services item, here's a place to look, Dave. And it's a weird place. And I, I, I agree, but, it, but it, it worked for me in the past. So system preferences, keyboard, shortcuts. John, where are you going with this? Oh, look at that. On the left side is different categories. One of them is called services. And then guess what? You see a list of the services. Now, some are built into the OS, but then some are added by third parties. Like, for example, Dave... Uh, let's see here. I think oh, I have open some. With, oh, I got, open I file and BB edit, right? Open PGP encrypt file. Yeah. Yeah. So what you do is if you see an action there, well, you right click on it and then you know what you're going to see. It's going to say show in finder. Uh, say show in finder. It's going to show you where that shortcut is located, or at least the folder within which it is located. It's like, for example, I just ran it. So I have some graphic converter shortcuts. Does I said this show work? in finder. Yeah. And it highlighted the application folder because graphic converter, oh. which has the shortcuts, is in the application folder. Okay. That, so that's what I was going to ask you because when I did it, it just highlighted my applications folder. It didn't go yes. and highlight the app itself, but okay, fair. Got Sometimes it. it'll go to a folder like a, another one that I highlighted. It, it went to my services folder, like in my library folder. Yeah. Because shortcuts can be embedded within an app or they could be in a services folder that I think, again, is in your library folder. So that makes sense. I don't know of another way to see your list of services other than going through the keyboard thing, which seems kind of weird. That's what I'm saying. It was like kind of out of left field. Yeah. I don't know if there's another way to get a list of all your services other than doing it through this like keyboard shortcut thing and then say show and finder. But that will tell you where the service is coming from. And oh yeah, yeah, because open PGP or open GPG goes to the services menu. Ah, I see, or the services folder. It if it is a built-in service, right clicking on it will yield nothing. I tried it yeah. on the open terminal yeah. here or whatever, and it's nothing. So yeah, you least, don't get yeah. You don't get a prompt. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, because yeah. it's built into the system, so it's like but but yeah, but it sounds like the issue here is that there are third party utilities being run on your behalf and you don't know why. So yeah. Yeah. This between the two of those, and actually, I had to d dig a little bit. I haven't been in the services menu for a while, and I really should be because there's a lot of good stuff there. It, well, that's yeah, yeah, you're right. Yep. It, and if you go into it, it back into keyboard uh, shortcuts services, like there's a lot of if you bother to go through this long list and turn on the things you want, turn off the things you don't. 
you really can make your Mac work really well. Like, uh, you know, I use this app called Image Optimize because it um, it it helps with optimizing images and we make them all the time. And I'm just noticing now that I can have a uh, service there for an image, which means when I right click on an image and I go to services, I see image optimizes right there. It's like, oh, yeah, I got to like I got to tweak because these it's things smart. So, yeah. So, the, so the thing is, the services menu tunes itself to the type of document that you're highlighting. Right. So, right. Obviously, you're not going to see a graphic converter thing on a text document. Uh, right. But, yeah, you get the idea. But though again, the root cause of the issue, I think, is is a, a, a device being. I mean, the other thing you mentioned is that he connected to iCloud. Now, I don't know if iCloud on its own, like installed. I, I just can't imagine it. Why it would find a reason to do that? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I do. BB yeah. Edit, you had to, you had to get from somewhere. I mean, it's either. BB Edit is installed maybe in a download folder. That, that That's why I suggested this application thing, because it will show you a location. But yep. Yep. I mean, yeah, it could be buried somewhere and you just, you know, forgot you downloaded it like ages ago. And that's why it's showing up in your menu. No, no, he said he did a fresh install, right? So how could it? Well, no, it'll show up in your menu if the app is there. Like the, the, well, no, but the thing is, it, 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 he said he did a clean install of Mojave on a machine. Sure, but like to your point earlier, if it's on an external drive, it's going to inherit it and mm. index it and add the services. So, yeah, that makes sense. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. What else we got? I think. Yeah. I think, man. I think we're at the end. I think we're. Uh, it's, it's how it's working. It's like the fourth quarter. Uh, I think. I think we're. In overtime. Are we doing the Hail Mary? Are we uh, doing Hail Mary? I think I think we're good. I think we won the game, man. I think we're we're fine. <laughs> the good news is we had no opposition, right? Everybody here rooted for the same team. The goal was to learn five new things, and I think we did that. So like it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I missed that one kick though, but you know. Well, it's okay. That's it's why we that's why we stack the agenda the way we do. Every now and then, you know, you miss one, but there's there's way more. At least five new things. We're not trying to hit the number this isn't blackjack where you gotta get, you know, two twenty one but not over. No, 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 no. We can go we can, five new things, it can be ten, it's okay. It's all good. Indeed. It's all good. Uh, yeah. Well, we already told you how to contact us, at least via email. If you're a premium subscriber, premium at MacGeekab.com is the way that you can reach us. Uh, if you want to come and join our forums, we would love to have you at MacGeekGab.com slash forums. It truly is a fantastic place. So much information there and uh, so many helpful people. All of you, all of us. It's just like, again, we all win. Nobody's out there to get anybody. And it, and I, like I say that, but and it's true. But I also understand that that is rare for Internet forums. And we are very fortunate to have a, such a fantastic community. So this is it's a good place to be. Mac case, Dave, yeah. Uh, you you should read the comments. Right. Exactly. For a lot of other Internet chat forums, I would say reading the comments is usually a bad idea. Yeah. Because it'll just get you angry or depressed. Or, right. Or right. Yeah, there's no battling happening here. We're all there to learn stuff and help no, each and other. No, and if there is... Uh, yeah. We shut it you down. Know, yeah. Well, we're admins, so, you know, we can just, you know, crush anybody if we want to. Delete but, that. Uh, we have I, And we I, have some I, I fantastic had, moderators. It, it's awesome. <laughs> no, really. It's, it's, it's a great place. So. <laughs> Check it out. Please do. Um, all right. Our thanks to, of course, Cashfly for providing the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Our thanks to all of our sponsors, of course, LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash MGG, PDF pen at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. Of course, Otherworld Computing is an ongoing sponsor. Bare Bones, of course, an ongoing sponsor. Some great sponsors coming on board, too. Very excellent. Have a great week, folks. We'll see you next week. Thanks for hanging out with us in the chat room. Hey, everybody there. MacGeekUp.com slash stream. You can join us. I think the next show will be about 5 p.m. Eastern on Monday. So come there. Check it out. John. Dave. Is there anything that's on your mind? Maybe one. No, not one word. Maybe two. No. I bet you can do this in three words. Four. Uh -oh. Five. Oh, no. What's happening? Oh, wait. No.
I'm sorry. No, it's just a Monty Python. Yes. Five. No, three. And the three things that I have for you, Dave, and everybody else is listening is don't get caught. Made up.